2 Corinthians 5. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Will you pray with me? So Father, as we look at your word today, will you open our eyes to see you, open our ears to hear you. May you speak through me, in me, and in spite of me. And may we see you. I understood up. In your name we pray. Amen. So it's the new year, and we are in the season of new beginnings. Um, I don't know about you, but I cannot count how many ads for fitness I've been bombarded with the last two weeks. In fact, I just opened my email at about 3.30 this morning, and what did I see? There's an email telling me there's a deal for Jillian Michaels' Body Revolution DVD. I'm like, come on, back off, everyone. You know, my, my Facebook feed has been inundated with, you know, people telling me about what their New Year's resolutions are, whether they're big or small. It seems every media source I turn to has something about resolutions, whether it's, you know, here are the top 10 resolutions people make, or here are the top 10 pe resolutions people make and fail at, or... <laughs> Here is how you can keep your New Year's resolution. We want to lose more weight. We want to slow down. We want to read more. We want to quit something. Enjoy life more. Learn more. We want to save more. I've heard the phrase, New Year, New You, like way too many times. <laughs> We're in a season where it seems collectively the world has decided to take stock of our lives, of their lives and to find all the areas where we could improve on, find all the areas where we could do better. More than any time of the year, the world has decided this is when we figure out what the problems are, and here's when we try and fix them. And on the one hand, I think there is something extremely healthy about that. There's something healthy about periodically taking time to take stock of life, to assess our lives, to try and challenge the status quo of our own existence to try to make positive changes. But I think there's one significant folly in New Year's resolutions. There's one folly that permeates this entire season. And that folly is thinking that somehow the key to a new you lies in our efforts. Our success is dependent on our willpower, on our strength of character. And when we fail our resolutions, as I have done many, many times in the past, they're just a result of us not trying hard enough, of not being strong enough. You know, if only we had tried more, if only we were stronger, if only life hadn't gotten in the way, if only we had bought the right equipment to help us with our goal, if only we had taken the right advice, if only we read the right books. We fool ourselves into thinking that on our own power and on our own volition, we can make the change to make ourselves new. And this is folly for us as Christians because we know that on our own, left to our own devices, we are hopeless in making ourselves new. In scripture today, we read that it's not the strong or the willful or the, or the determined or the motivated it's not those people that become new. But as verse 17 says, it's those who find themselves in Christ Jesus. 
Anyone who is in Christ, the new creation has come. The world is right when they try and find the ways in which we have failed at this time. The world is right to ask us to take stock of our lives, to find where we are wanting. But the world is wrong in thinking that the solution to our inadequacies, to our sins and to our failings, the solution lies in ourselves. Because we know on our own, all is lost. We know that all of us have sinned and all of us fall short of the glory of God. We know that there is no one righteous, not even one. No amount of good intentions or good works on our own will ever be enough to fix the flaw that is our sinful nature. We know that on our own, we're the people who are inclined to take the path of least resistance that we are the people inclined to look out only for ourselves, that we're the kind of people to lie, cheat, and steal our way through life. We're the kind of people who will be gracious and merciful and compassionate only if it doesn't cost us a thing. We know deep down we are scoundrels, we are broken, we are flawed. We are so very human. On our own we're lost, we're hopeless, and we're doomed, and no amount of self-help or resolution <coughs> will ever remedy that. But we can know these things and not despair. We can know these things about ourselves and not despair. Because we know as bad as it is on our own, we know God's love is great enough to overcome any and all of this. God's love overcomes our sinfulness. God's love overcomes our hopelessness. God's love overcomes the evil that surrounds us. This is exactly why we celebrated Christmas. Because we celebrate the fact that though we were helpless in our sins, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son <clears throat> that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. We know he became one of us. He dwelled with us. He died for our sins, he rose again. We know God's love. We know that he saw us in our most pitiful state and did not abandon us, but decided that, you know what? I'm gonna do everything I can to save these people. I'm gonna do everything I can to reconcile with these people. This is exactly what we read in today's passage. In verse 21, we read that our salvation does not come from any abilities of our own, but all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against us. While we were sinners, Christ died for us and raised us up with him. While we were lost, Christ found us and invited us as his own. While we were mired in sin, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God. As our scripture points out today, all the work in making ourselves new has already been completed. If we are in Christ, the old creation is gone and we are made new. The old has passed away and the new has come. And so we live today in that reality that God has made us new and God is making us new. He is empowering us. He is changing us. He is redeeming us. He's recreating us to be the children of God. And because it is God doing this and not us, we know He can accomplish it. He will accomplish it. We know that with God, all things are possible because in Christ, all is new. And so in this season, there's no need to say, new year, new you. Christ has already done it. He has already redeemed us. He's already formed us. He's already saved us from our sins and from ourselves. And he simply invites us to come to him, to dwell in him to surrender to him and let him do the rest. <clears throat> and in some ways, I could end the sermon right there. We're done. The message of the sermon is stop trying to fix yourselves because Christ has already done it. 
Stop trying to better yourselves because Christ has already redeemed you far and above and beyond anything you could ever ask or imagine. Stop trying to make yourself new because in Christ you're already a new creation. And the more we lean on Him, the more we trust Him, the more we center our lives on Him, then there is nothing Christ can't accomplish through us. I could end it right there. But as I looked at the passage, I realized there was one more tiny detail that we just cannot miss. And I think it's important for us at Harvard at the beginning of the year to not miss this critical little detail as we look forward this year. And that detail is this. God has not made us new for the sake of just making us new. God has not made us new for its own sake. God hasn't saved us and redeemed us and breathed new life into us just so we can carry on with life as it was before. But as Paul writes, God made us new so we can be ministers of reconciliation in the world. He has called us to go into a world that's desperately trying to make itself new. He's called us to go into a world that is scrambling to try everything from the newest, from the latest meditation techniques to the newest fad diet to the latest business advice. God's asked us to go to a world desperately trying to get itself out of the funk that it's in. And he's called us to go and tell this world, guess what? In Christ, this world can be made new. He calls us to go into this world to the broken places and tell it that Christ has come to heal the sick, to bind up the wounded. He has come to restore the broken. He's come to comfort the lost to build up the poor, to, fi to be friend to the lonely, and to fill the gnawing emptiness that seems to be so much of our society. We can go because within each and every one of us, Christ has promised that he has already born a new creation in us. And I really think this was something I missed most of my life. When I was growing up, I used to think that the point of being a Christian was just to be saved. But the point of going to church was to escape going to hell. And the biggest thing to know, you know, was that Christ was Lord of my life and Savior of my soul, and we'll call that good, and I can go home. And don't get me wrong, all of these things are true. <laughs> Jesus Christ has saved us. Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives. And because of all he's done, I no longer have to fear death. I no longer have to fear hell. These things are true. But I think that Paul is reminding us that Christ came to do that and he came to do so much more. He's not just interested in recon the reconciliation of my soul, of your soul, of all the souls of all of us in this church. But he's interested in reconciling the whole world to himself. Every square inch, every dark corner. He is interested in reconciling himself with every heart, every tongue, every nation, every land. And here in Seattle, the message is still the same. God has come to reconcile himself with every corner of this city. And he's asked us, all of us who believe, all of us who are found in him, to join him in this ministry of reconciliation, to be his hands and feet, to share his love and grace, to point this world to Christ, to salvation, and to eternity. At the harbor, we need to remember, and I need to remind myself, we don't exist for ourselves. We're not here for ourselves. It isn't good enough that we just come on Sunday and we worship together, even though that's, that's great. But it's not good enough because God has called us to be made new and to be ministers of reconciliation to this world. And the question I ask myself also, that's great, Paul, how? <laughs> um, and so I came across this verse that um, Paul says, therefore, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. And I really think that it's key to understanding what it means to go out into the world and be a minister of reconciliation. 
And what does it mean to be to regard no one from a worldly point of view? I think that means that part of what God has born anew within us is that He's given us new eyes to see this world. He's given us a new way to look at the world. Because the old way of looking at the world was to divide and conquer, was to dismiss, to look at the external factors, to find out who is worth loving and who is not. The old eyes of the world dismissed people because they were of a different age, of a different race, of a different gender. They dismissed people because of wealth or physical appearance. The old eyes tried as much as possible to find the people who are just like us and dismiss everyone who's not. The old way of looking at the world allowed us to create enemies and people that we're supposed to hate. It let us write off our difficult colleagues, our troublesome neighbors. It let us give up on unteachable students. But the new eyes Christ has given us the new way of looking at the world calls us to see every man, every woman, every child as first and foremost a child of God, precious in His sight. And that means no matter how unlikable they are, no matter how difficult they are, no matter how unpleasant, there is no one God His reconciling love does not extend to. There is no one God's reconciling love does not extend to. There is no such thing as a person unworthy of our love and our care. There is no one to whom our fellowship and our friendship cannot be extended, no matter how different they are from us. <clears throat> there is no one to whom this ministry of reconciliation does not go to. We talked a lot about, um, back in the summer in a couple of weeks now, about the fact that we have our unavoidable world and our avoidable world. And the more I think about it, the more I think that it was the old way of looking at the world that allowed us to create an avoidable world in the first place. It's the old way of looking at the world that allows us to conjure up places and peoples and groups for whom we don't have to deal with. But the new eyes of faith that Christ has given us allows us to begin to see that there is no place on earth where the ministry of reconciliation does not go to. God so loved the whole world, not my little corner of it. In our passage we read that God is reconciling the whole world to himself. So there's no place we can't ignore, whether it's the remotest corner of this city or across the street. So for us as Harvard Church, I think it's important to ask ourselves at the beginning of this year, where is God calling us to be ministers of reconciliation? Where are the places that we've allowed ourselves to ignore? Where we've conveniently excluded people from the ministry of reconciliation? We need to ask ourselves, where are the places and people that God is showing us here is where we need to go? We need to ask ourselves, how will Harvard Church change if we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view? And I just have one more thought on this passage, and I'm going to close. This passage is in some ways very special to me because um, when I was growing up, um, I was in a youth group and we called ourselves um, Christ Ambassadors. And we used this passage as kind of a theme um, passage growing up. Um, and in many ways, it was a blessing for me to have this passage instilled in me from an early age. Um, because as I read about what it meant to be Christ's ambassadors, to be someone who goes into the world to represent him. I realized from an early age, I'm not allowed to just be someone who sits in a pew on Sunday. But there was one problem that we had, and that was that we kept emphasizing that to be a minister of reconciliation and to be Christ's ambassador, 
that was something we needed to become, some uh, title we needed to live up to. And I remember when I first started getting involved when I was like 13 or 14 now, I remember thinking, you know what, I'm not really, I'm not really there yet to be worthy of this title of Christ's ambassador, but you know, I'm a beginner, so whatever, I can get to that point eventually. You know, at some point, if I keep plugging away, my flaws and my imperfections will fall to the wayside, and I will be that nice, righteous ambassador for Christ, winning the world for Him. And so I kept plugging away. I kept trying to do everything possible to make me worthy of the title of Christ's ambassador. I read my Bible, I prayed, I devoted myself to every task I could come up with in the church. I tried to stop all my bad habits, but then... When I went away to college, I realized I still had all my flaws. And I still had a few less sins, but still sins nonetheless. And I was still not worthy of being called true ambassador of Christ, perfect representation of Him in the world. And I think my flaw was thinking that somehow I had to make myself worthy of that title. I had to be the one to do it. And in that way, I was just like everyone else making a New Year's resolution, thinking that I had to make myself new. But as I read this passage, the ministry of reconciliation really isn't something that we ever have to earn. The ministry of reconciliation is something Christ has already given to us. And more importantly, in order to be ministers of reconciliation, we really don't have to be perfect. We just have to be willing. Earlier in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul writes, We have this treasure of Christ in us, in jars of clay, to show that this all-surpassing power comes not from us, but it comes from God. God is more than capable of making up for our weaknesses and our flaws. God doesn't have to wait for us to be perfect before He can use us. Because His love and power can more than make up for our frailness. And at the end of 2 Corinthians, I, didn't, I never connected this before. But Paul makes the point even more abundantly clear that in order to be used by Him in this ministry, we really don't have to be perfect. In chapter 12, verse 9, he says, Christ tells us, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect through weakness. God doesn't just make up for our flaws or go around them or, you know, figure out we can make this work. But sometimes he can even use our weakest points to bring the greatest glory to his kingdom. He is ready for us now, no matter where we might be in our faith. So the key to being a minister of reconciliation is not trying to better ourselves or be a more worthy representation of Jesus Christ. It's not about learning more, or about trying harder, or about doing more stuff. <clears throat> and please hear me yet, this is not a New Year's resolution sermon. Now we just need to become ministers of reconciliation by trying more. Because God has already made us that. God has already made us new. God has already saved us. He's already redeemed us. He's already called us as His own and commissioned us to be His ambassadors, warts and all. Our only requirement is to go. Go find the lost. Go find the broken. Go find the hungry and the poor. Go to the lonely places of the world. Go to the alienated parts of this city and tell the world Christ has come to make all things new. The old has passed away. The old ways that lead to death, to pain, to destruction, they've gone. And the new has come. New life, new hope. And the everlasting reconciling love of God. We just have to go. Pray with me.
So as your prophet Samuel said, here, my Lord, your servant listens. We don't claim to know exactly what you're calling us to do next, but we pray that you just open our hearts and open our eyes to see where you want us to go. We lay our lives before you. Take us as we are and use us for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen.